Kyle here from allmediareviews.blogspot.com and artist review Pink Floyd part three and also sort of related but and this is going to be sort of less sort of elaboration and more just kind of talking about and showing stuff so I didn't show this I don't think in my the last video and I wish I had because I didn't even, I hadn't even opened it so I have this bootleg so going back before in the whole timeline of the previous two videos this is a the, the an animal show from 1977 Berlin. This is called Pink Floyd Animals in Berlin 1977, as you can see. Pretty thick uh, pressing of vinyl. The whole animals record, and that's really all it is. But um, 2008, so yeah, I don't know. Probably come from some some you know maybe a, maybe a soundboard that was done there or a, a circulated bootleg. Um, I don't know, I was trying to look on the back there to see if it actually has a date. Of course, Animals being my favorite and many people's favorites uh, studio record from Pink Floyd. Um, so that's the biggest reason why I bought it. Although, I mean, Pink Floyd, you do see live um, bootlegs, of course. I've got, I showed a couple other ones earlier, um, but um, on vinyl even. But I don't typically see some of the later Floyds, really the early stuff, um, the Sid stuff, the pre-Dark Side stuff. Um, but I'm trying to see here, Peter... Oh, okay, also available, Peter Gable Live at the bottom line 77. I don't know if they have a date on here. They have an address somewhere in Sweden, maybe it was like distribute Danny Line Records, Bellman Gotten, Bell Bellman's Gatan. Uh, in Gothenburg, but um, oh, there it is. <laughs> she looked up there. Yeah, it was it was uh, January 29th, 29 one or one one twenty nine nineteen seventy seven. So yeah, you know, my favorite Pink Floyd record live. So anyway, after the wall, of course, Pink Floyd had the much sort of documented, written about, and you know, <laughs> controversial uh, story of what happened, and a lot of it was just it was Roger Waters running. The show, for the most part, but Gil Morrison was contractually obligated to be there to a point. But they released the final cut, and the final cut's always been sort of a, an elusive record to me. When I bought it, when I was in high school, I bought the cassette tape. Um, I was just of the belief that it was B-sides from the wall, and um, and I actually did like moments on it. I remember, um, but I didn't. I don't know, I never got fully into it, and I, you know, I just, I still, to this day, think a lot of the music does sound like The Wall, but, um, unlike The Wall, it doesn't have, it doesn't go, obviously, go, it's not, whatever, 100 some odd minutes, it doesn't have as much preachy story, I mean, it is thematic, and it's about, a, you know, if it is a concept album, which, you know, to a point, I suppose it is, about, um, you know, war and anti-war and that kind of stuff, um, I guess if I had to choose some of my favorites, the Poor Sword Dream, The Hero's Return, um, the title track, I always like the title track, um, you know, and uh, people are, are just, uh, what is the one, uh, Fletcher Memorial Home, I think, which I'm looking for it on here, and I'm not sure this version has, oh yeah, it does, a lot of people on their reviews, including D Downfall and I know Mr. Superior, um, aren't really all, all that into that track, and while I, I don't love it, I guess I've appreciated it to a point when Shadow Gallery did that 25-minute uh, amazing medley, the Floydian Memories, they incorporated part of it and it really worked. So the the sort of, uh, you know, uh, Fletcher Memorial, da da da, won't it need to be closer, close, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a record I haven't spent you know, when I did that re research a few years ago, I got a little more into it, and I concluded almost like, well, I don't prefer it to the wall. I almost would go to it more than the wall on a regular basis, just because it's not so long, but it has a similar kind of feel to it in a lot of respects. Um, but it, you know, it, it definitely still feels like a like a Roger Waters driven record, even though the stuff before it was too. Uh, you know, going back to really wish you were here. Um, anyway, so. That was the last, obviously, Roger Waters album, uh, the album that he played with on Pink for Pink Floyd. Um, and so what I do have, which, which kind of followed that, and I think that was like 82 or 83, if I'm not mistaken. 
It was uh, 82, yeah. This was recorded in December of 82. 83. So, um, right on the time of, like, Thriller and then, you know, right on the radio at that time. Um, but I have a couple of the solo records from Gilmore and Waters, and my computer keeps on doing that. Uh, the self, I think this is the self-titled. No, this is about face, which I know one of Gilmore's re s solo records is a lot easier to find than the other ones and less highly regarded. I think this is probably the lesser of the two because I think he put out one in the '70s, maybe after Animals. I don't have that one, and I don't know if I've ever even heard it. Maybe heard some a few tracks here and there, um, but you know, I have it. I think I paid, yeah, I paid a buck for this thing. I mean. <laughs> So it was just like a sort of, well, it is David Gilmore, and it's only a dollar, you know. I mean, I guess it's collecting dust and it takes up space, and if I'm looking to purge a lot of this crap that I have, why am I buying it? But, you know, just as sort of a Pink Floyd, you know, hardcore of sorts, I, I, I just picked it up. You know, it's got the lyrics, some pictures, you know. I think he was probably just kind of doing something away from Floyd or what was trying to be different from Pink Floyd but you know I can't really comment that much and then of course this is I believe this is Radio Chaos you know I mean there's there's three or four Roger Waters solo albums and I've always struggled when I've listened to them but again I paid only a couple bucks I think I maybe got this on a sale so at half price books um, but different people I think have different opinions about his solo records some people say the best record is Pros and Cons of Hitchhiking. Some people say this is the best record. Some people say Amused to Death. If I'm not mistaken, Mr. Sapir supported Amused to Death. Um, but I, I know that a lot of people that are, you know, Floyd fanatics have said that, you know, none of his solo records have captured what he did, you know, when he was, when he, when he was driving the Floyd ship, of course. Um, but I don't know, you know, and I've, I've, you know, like David Gilmore, I've never invested that much time into his solo records. Just I've listened to them here and there, I've sampled them, and this is, I think, the first one I ever end up even buying. But, but this came out '87, so this might have been his second one. I think it was Pros and Cons. Yeah, Pros and Cons was the first one. Like I don't have it, and I can't really comment on that much on this one either, other than the whole comparison. Then Amused to Death, I think, followed that. If I'm not getting my, my history wrong. So, all right, so then here comes the controversy a little bit. I do have the 12-inch single for Learning to Fly, and I saw this at Half Price Books, and I got this for half off. I don't, I, <laughs> I know people will even say it's sacrilege, you know, if you're even buying anything, spending any kind of money on um, anything from the, uh, the, the Momentary Lapse of Reason, which came on in 87, but I, I'm sorry, but I happen to actually like Momentary Lapse Reason. I don't like it as much as some of the other records, but I would put it ahead of a few of the records for sure. Um, but, and so I, you know, this this was, you don't see their 12-inch singles very much, so I just snatched it up and I found, uh, I found it for, um, this is a promo, demonstration not for sale, as it says. I found it for half price at half price books. Go figure out on one of their sales and um, you know for rarity's sake for collector's sake and just it's not, not a bad song I, I actually like it and then I did find this when I know this I originally the first time I saw a copy of a momentary lapse of reason they wanted 40 or 50 bucks for it I didn't pay that much for this copy but I think I paid maybe 15 or 20 for it of course you know at this point because Richard Wright had uh, sort of been phased out he came back of course it Mason and I think he came back I could be wrong. <laughs> I don't want to speak ill well. Uh, Richard Wright is on here. I'm not sure how much of the writing he did, but uh, this is, of course, Gilmore sort of driving the ship at Waters and him, that whole controversy. But Nick Mason, of course, this has 2011, which, you know, I think it also has, because he didn't play on the tour. Kevin Gilbert's bass player, like Tony Matinee's bass player, I'm pretty sure played on the tour for Momentary Lapse Reason. But, um,. Bob Ezrin, you know, the, they had some other people showing up here. But moment, or Carmine Apice, who I actually did meet, he's on here. And Patrick Leonard of Toy Matinee with Kevin Gilbert. Um, I knew there was some Kevin Gilbert and Toy Matinee connections with Momentary Lapse of Reason. A Momentary Lapse of Reason. Um, I know people, again, think this doesn't sound like Pink Floyd or whatever. It was the, the first Pink Floyd record 
that was out when I sort of knew who they were, although I still was post haste because I didn't get into them until, what, 91 or 92, but at the time, this is their newest record, and they were playing Learning to Fly and on the Turning Away on the radio. Um, and it was one of the first albums I bought on cassette, and, um, I mean, Learning to Fly has been overplayed. I would never deny that, um, but it's, to me, Dogs of War is not annoying. I actually don't mind that song. It's It kind of grew on me. I don't love it, but I don't mind it. I guess it's kind of kind of the middle. A New Machine, Terminal Frost is kind of an ambient passage piece. That I enjoy. But Sorrow is another one that I've always liked. Um, I think if I'm not mistaken, it's kind of a ballad, like on Turning Away. So th there aren't any like sort of proggy, long, extensive epics on here, and it wasn't as conceptual as The Wall, or even The Final Cut, I suppose. But I, I'm sorry, it has, it has sort of an 80s tinge to it, but it's not as sort of plasticky sounding as some of the, like the 80s Yes albums, or even Genesis to a point. There's still some more like production depth to it, I guess. Some people think it might be overproduced. I, 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 I take it as the style, and I can stomach it a little bit easier than, say, some of the Yes and Genesis stuff from this period. But anyway, so I don't have... On vinyl, I mean to buy the Division Bell. Of course, they came out with before they came out with Delicate Sounds of Thunder, which is a record I've and they had the video for that too. I guess I think I checked it out from the video store, but I've never bought that record. But I've listened to parts of it, like on bootlegs and stuff, like on cassette tape, like co dub copies. And I know I think they did echoes on that. I'm pretty, pretty sure I could be wrong. I'm not. I could pull it up, but um, but I just in, in the interest of time. Um, just kind of say that's one of the the live albums, and of course they put out the Division Bell in '94, and when I was I was a senior in high school, and that was a great breath of fresh air, another Pink Floyd album, um, and it has a lot of tracks I enjoy from uh, High Hopes to uh, Marooned to um, Wearing the Inside Out, even uh, to uh, it has a lot of really good songs. Um, Coming back to life, I remember associating that when Michael Jordan came back, they played that. <laughs> when he came back to the Bulls, but um, that's a great inspirational track. Um, Keep Talking, of course, has the Stephen Hawking. I think of uh, Division Bell as much for Keep Talking and Stephen Hawking as anything else. Um, what am I th I'm forgetting a few of the, the better tracks on there. Oh, Lost for Words, of course, and I played that on... I wanted to play that on my college radio station, but of course, it has the line, go fuck yourself, and I, you know, you had to deal with, uh, you know... FCC issues, and I'm just like a 19-year-old kid who's, you know, never been on the radio before, but yeah, I mean, the, the Division Bell is a step up from Momentary Last Reason, I will not deny that in the least, um, and it's it's sort of in the middle, I'd put Momentary Lapse a little further down, but I think both the records are decent, I would put, in terms of re-listenability, both of them ahead of the final cut, for sure, and probably even the wall in the sense that I would go back to it, I mean, I, I wouldn't rate Momentary Lapse overall over the wall, but I think Division Bell, I probably would, though. Oh, easily, I would. Um, so moving on to the, the, I mean, the solo stuff side project, of course they released Pulse with the, the, the summer of 95, I remember that specifically. I still have it. Of course, the battery that made the, the little light blink, that, that battery eventually, eventually, it was supposed to last like five or ten years, and mine was working for a number of years after. I don't remember when it stopped, but, and that has the complete dark side, if I'm not mistaken, because they did that. Um, a lot of Division Bell stuff, but um, I can't remember some of the other deep. I know the tour. I did not see the tour. I always regret this. The the spring of 1994, or summer of 94. I went to Rush. See Rush. I'd never seen Rush, and I didn't go to see Pink Floyd. Although Pink Floyd was playing in Minnesota at the Metrodome, which my friend did go to that show, and he said it was basically like a light show. I mean, the sound probably was in and out. However, then my friend the next summer ended up getting a bunch of bootlegs and included some of the stuff from the Minneapolis show, which was great to hear. Um, but I'll just move on, you know, that period of time. Of course, Floyd went into hibernation and just kind of were over that point. For the most part, in the, 2006 was the next thing that really hurt. I mean, Roger Watt, Gilmore toured, I know. Or I don't know if they ever toured. No, they didn't. They did the reunion, of course, at Live 8 in 2005. But then I think it was the next year, maybe it was around that, that same year, David Gilmore put out On an Island, which I never listened to until a couple years ago. And... My friend was always talking about how it was like a basically the sequel to the Division Bell, and I don't like On an Island as much as the Division Bell at all. But it has some moments, but it kind of it's it's definitely less consistent than the Division Bell. But I can sort of understand lyrically 
Uh, some of the lyrics are so almost therapeutic. Um, but yeah, I mean, as far as David Gilmore stuff goes, that was that record probably is on par, or maybe a little bit better from what I've heard. I haven't heard, you know, like I said, his first solo album, which maybe is considered his best. Maybe I'll do a video for that. But anyway, um, and of course, then Gilmore and Waters toured. Gilmore did some tours. I never saw him, of course. Waters toured. Waters toured Dark Side of the Moon. Then he toured The Wall in the last few years in that movie. And then, of course, they put out uh, The Endless River, which I've only listened to like two or three times. It's interesting, but it's just all ambient music. It's great. There's one in one song with vocals on it. Um, and again, it's sort of uh, an afterthought. I mean, I don't have a problem with it, but at the same time, I don't think of it in the Pink Floyd canon. You put it at the very bottom, but I don't even I wouldn't even put it in there, I guess, in a sense. And of course, Gilmore put out this, his last solo record, which I can't even remember, Unlocking something? Rattle That Lock, I think it was called, 2014. And again, that was kind of, I don't know, The Endless River and that. I mean, I'm not sure which one was more memorable. Um, but, I, you know, I, I don't fault them. At their age, at, that, at this time in their careers, anything is gravy for the most part. But um, that's my spin on sort of the post, the wall, Pink Floyd. Uh, the best thing that's come out from Pink Floyd related to me in the last decade and change is that that Shadow Gallery Floydian Memories 25-minute epic tribute, which is just pure genius. So, anyway, thanks for watching. Please comment, like, subscribe. Uh, I know a lot of you will probably disagree with me. And <laughs> to quote Mr. Superior, I'll still think you're idiots. But um, I think we can. most people can agree the Division Bell is a great record. So, thanks for watching.